All right, welcome back to another After Dark, everybody. Um, I had a request to uh, react to a video about Dr. J, and I think it's long overdue. Long overdue. We've covered a lot of people from his era, but we have not given Dr. J his due respect, and today is the day for that. Um, as far as a high flyer, before there was Jordan, there was Dr. J, man. Julius Irving was an absolute beast. Um, it was always battling in the East. Um, him and Larry Bird were, were hella rivals over there. And um, yeah, um, ABA star. And actually, you know, there's going to be stuff that I learn off of this too. Because I was such a young, a young man when uh, Dr. J was, was doing his thing. Uh, he was even playing before I was born. So there, there's a lot of his career and a lot of the stuff uh, that he's accomplished. I'm sure I don't actually even know about. So this is going to be fun. Um, I picked a video uh, from Clayton Crowley. Um, looks like a good documentary. And the name of the video is The Legend of Dr. J, The Man Who Flew. Um, so as always, I'm going to leave the original video down below if you want to check it out without my commentary. Uh, that's going to be in the description down below as always. Everybody else, please leave this video a like. I really appreciate it and it always helps. And Dr. J is one of those guys that he's not going to get a lot of views. But if you like Dr. J and you think more people should be exposed to Dr. J, that's what we, that's what we use the like button for. You know, because it pushes the video out to, 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 to more to more people. So, you know, I noticed it because we get a lot of requests. I, I get a lot of requests for, you know, Kareem and Wilt and uh, Russell and, and a lot of these greats. But it's sad for me to see that not a lot of people are watching this stuff. Everyone just is, is watching uh, like about three or four basketball players. And everybody else just is kind of being forgotten. And that's part of what this channel is, though. Part of what this channel is, is appreciating the love of the game and the players that make me love the game. And I think that's 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 what you, you all are in here for, too. We're not just here, like, embracing the hate, you know. And I know we don't like where basketball is at right now, but let's appreciate the things we love about basketball. And one of those is Dr. J, so let's do it. Legends. The players that are remembered long after their playing days end. And indeed, forget about Dr. J a little bit because of how great Michael Jordan ended up being. I feel like before Jordan, there was a lot more appreciation for Dr. J. Let me know. I'm curious because I might have been part of that too. You know, like, oh, he's Jordan's the better Dr. J kind of mentality. You know how we all do it. Like, he was good, but this guy's better and played similar. Julius Winfield Irving II also known as Dr. J. Yes, sir. If you know anything about him, you know that he is unequivocally the coolest basketball yeah. player of all time. If you don't, consider this your education. As an introduction, just check out this picture from Doc's days playing with the New York Nets in the late 70s in the ABA. Just on appearance alone, I don't think you can get much cooler. <laughs> the afro, the gold, the goatee, even the red, white, and blue of the uniform. Dude, just he, I, I didn't know they were allowed to wear uh, wear jewelry during games back then, or in the ABA. Make this guy look like the quintessential basketball player. And in a way, that's exactly what he was. He spent the prime of his career in the ABA, a renegade basketball league full of wackos and nut jobs at every level that sold themselves as the energetic, fast-paced foil to the NBA's slower, methodical style. To the people that really care about the sport, Doc remains a living legend, a guy who defined his era culturally and aesthetically, propelling the sport of basketball into the modern age. He wasn't supposed to be. Julius Irving was a lightly recruited forward out of high school and ended up playing at the University of Massachusetts. He had great measurables, incredibly long arms and hands that you had to see to believe. According to sources I could find, his hand was nine and a half inches long from the base of his palm to the tip of his middle finger. Damn. And when splayed out, measured 11 and a half inches from the tip of his thumb to the tip of his pinky. Oh man, if anybody does the research out there, who's got the, the, the bigger hands, MJ or him? 
Ironically, the year before his first varsity season, college basketball's ruling body had banned players from dunking the basketball. Irving made do and focused his game in other ways, perfecting sweeping layups and finger rolls while finding a knack for rebounding, often skying high above the heads of others and grabbing the ball out of the air with a single hand. Julius experienced remarkable success in his first varsity season, averaging over 20 points and over 20 rebounds for the entire season. 20 and 20. Still, on an obscure basketball program in a nearly unheard of conference, his imagination had never once wandered toward professional basketball. In the summer before his junior year of college, Julius found himself back home in New York City, spending his days tearing across the city's renowned street courts. There, on the most famous street court in the mecca of the basketball world, the Rucker Park in Harlem, Julius Irving made a name for himself. And the name oh, was yeah. Dr. J. While Irving had never been allowed to dunk in college, here players were only limited by their creativity and daring. Totally unleashed from the restrictions of collegiate hoops, Julius would submit dunks, rebounds, blocks, and layups that started drawing crowds from all over the city. As it was happening, crowds and MCs searched for a fitting nickname. They tried things like the Hawk and the Pearl after Connie Hawkins and Earl yeah, Monroe. Look at all this. They tried Black Jesus, Moses, and so on. But none of them really stuck. In his childhood, though, Julius had nicknamed one of his friends who had a penchant for long-winded arguments, the Professor. Tickled by this, the friend declared that if he were the Professor, then Julius should be the doctor, so as to form a complete duo. Nice. So as the search for Irving's nickname continued, he finally declared himself that if he were to be called anything, he should be called the doctor. The doctor became Dr. Julius, and Dr. Julius became Dr. J. Before long, the city's pro ranks, real bona fide NBA players, started to show up to test the mettle of this Dr. J. Dude, this is cool, this is cool. I forget about the origins. Nobody could stop the doctor. For the first time in his life, Julius Irving entertained the idea that he just might have what it takes to break into the professional ranks of basketball. After another 2020 season, Dr. J did just that. He took his chance and joined the ABA. After that junior year, a 21-year-old Julius Irving accepted a four-year contract to join the Virginia Squires. Again, though, this was not seen as a major steal or a poaching job. Most people had still never heard of Julius Irving, and even if they had, it wasn't like he was any kind of real star. In fact, the Squires owner barely knew anything about Doc when he signed him. That's that's fair, because it's not like they had the internet, you know? So it's not like viral videos are spreading all over the place on what this guy's doing in Rucker. It's like, if you know, you know kind of situations. But as he walked away from their first meeting, he remarked to somebody nearby, Hey, did you see the meat hooks on that guy? Julius Irving debuted as a professional basketball player for the Virginia Squires in the 1971-1972 season. In that first season, he proved that he did belong as a professional, making the All-Star team and being named to the second team All-ABA. That first season was good enough that it ignited one of the crazier contract disputes in basketball history, which included a crooked agent and three different teams in two different leagues. I highly recommend you look it up. It is bonkers. Huh. You know what else is bonkers? That's right, baby. The sponsor of today's video. Oh, jeez. Factor. Factor. Okay. Factor is a meal delivery subscription service e that ships pre prep Yep. Yep. You want some pre-prep food instead of cooking for yourself? Go for it. I happen to love cooking. Some of this stuff looks all right, though. Okay. Are we there? Are we there? Are we there? There we go. Okay. Factor, everybody. Factor, everybody, if you want to support Clayton. Turned to the Squires for the 73 season and enjoyed a breakout year, leading the league in scoring, making first team All-ABA, and again being named an All-Star. He had quickly become the young face of the ABA, the most entertaining, energizing player in a sport that was looking for exactly that. So, of course, the Squires sold his contract to the New York Nets for cash. Because, you know, the ABA was insane. Which brings us to the good stuff. The peak of Dr. J's powers. Doc spent his apex years with the Nets, winning the ABA League MVP award in 1974, 
75, and 76. Damn, three-peat. Those years saw his fame and talent- Three-peat of MVPs. Passed beyond superstar status and into legend. He had maintained his rebounding prowess, developed into an above average passer for his position, and delighted at using his physical talents to strip opponents and block shots. But the lasting effect of Julius Irving's nice. prime was the weaponization of the slam dunk. Perhaps no player is more synonymous with the dunk than Julius Irving. Yeah. In the 60s, Elgin Baylor ignited a spark, taking something that had previously been reserved for centers as a show of brute force and power and had infused it with a level of excitement. Doc took that spark and created an inferno. When Doc attacked the basket, he became a wizard, an innovator, doing things that no one had thought possible. He injected style, creativity, artistry, and individuality with his acrobatics. Exactly what the ABA and the sport of basketball as a whole needed. <laughs> I can't emphasize the point enough. The dunk is to basketball what the home run is to baseball because of Dr. J. Yeah, that's fair. All this stuff that we enjoy of, of, of Michael Jordan and Vince Carter and all these guys that came afterwards. Well, they came after him. Somebody had to go first. And it's true. It wasn't big men dunking anymore. It wasn't just big men. All of a sudden, there was a smaller dude out here flying around with grace. And a lot of people don't, don't seem to know anymore. We all did back in the day. But the dunk contest like wizard, it was Dr. J. It wasn't originally Jordan. Jordan just kind of took that over, and Vince Carter took it from there. Um, but yeah, that free throw dunk too, that was Dr. J. But Dr. J didn't do the dribble up. He did a straight run. And then a takeoff, and he also didn't do the cradles. But this is how, just like in music or any other any other art goes, somebody's got to innovate, and then you can take that as the foundation and add on to it. So that's all Jordan did. He added on to it. He added the dribble up, and then he added the cradle on the uh, on the dunk. But the first person crazy enough to be at this height and dunk from the damn free throw line, that was Dr. J all the way. There were players who dunked before him, and there have been players who dunked after. But what is still perhaps the most exciting moment of a basketball game, the moment when a player is streaking down the court, loads his power into his lead foot, picks up his dribble, and skies towards the rim, was the signature move of the doctor. And to watch him do it with those mitts, the way he picks up the ball like it's nothing. Yeah. It looked like he was made to do Damn, it. Yeah, man, look how he's palming the ball. He was unarguably the, the most exciting basketball player in any league. And yet his legend propagated in a way that was almost totally unique to him. The ABA did not have a national TV deal. So it spread through word of mouth and written accounts. Imagine that. An athlete that defied imagination, that left every spectator, reporter, and opponent speechless with his ability, but who the vast majority of fans could not see. Yeah. His feats became mythical, similar to someone like Andre the Giant. <laughs> his reputation became almost folklore, making no story seem too outlandish. He jumped 12 feet in the air. He took off from half court. He could have dunked on a 20-foot rim. Of course, the stories were hyperbole, but they only served to further prop him up as this practically alien athlete. Dr. J became a legend before some people even knew what he looked like. Like he was some powerful storm advancing toward land. <laughs> One with a name and a face and a power that you know is out there, but that you just have no way of seeing yet. His first two seasons with the Nets were nothing short of incredible. They'd won the championship in 74, Doc had won back-to-back -back MVP awards and collected every award the ABA had to offer. And all of a sudden, the ABA had a sense of legitimacy. Few games were sellouts, even for the Nets, but the ABA was the place where the doctor played. Yeah. While Kareem was still unquestionably the best player in the world, Julius Irving was the essential basketball player. Yeah, it, it's like it's sport and it's also entertainment. So Kareem might have been the best, but he wasn't the most entertaining to watch. In comes Dr. J and people, people want to watch this guy play because it's just exciting. That's entertaining. While Kareem was utilizing the sky hook a mechanical, repetitive, mm -hmm. boring move that still stands as the most awesome weapon in basketball history, Dr. J was soaring, employing the skills of improvisation, unpredictability, and excitement, moving in ways that you can't predict or even recognize, let alone get in front of. If he wasn't already, 
By this point, he was the ABA's meal ticket. Yeah. The league's commissioner, Dave DeBusher, said that while many players might get called the franchise, Dr. J was the league. And if his pure skill and intensity had not already made him the most valuable attraction in basketball, it cannot go overlooked that Julius Irving goes down as one of the classiest athletes in any sport ever. Throughout his career, he was known to wait in the locker room, giving interviews and answering questions until every last fan had an autograph, every notepad was filled, every tape recorder run empty. He was articulate, intelligent, gracious, patient, and humble to an astonishing degree. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's, it's, good, it's good to hear that he's, he's staying extra and, and signing autographs for kids and stuff. I really like that. As reported by nearly every human being who he has ever come into contact with. Bill Daniels, the owner what? of the... Just bled past the screen? Every human Hold being on. who he has ever come into contact with. What the hell is that? Degree, as Sorry, reported guys. by nearly every human being who he has ever come into contact. Sorry, I gotta know. With. I gotta know. Except for that one scrap with Larry Bird, and that one thing with the reporter. But whatever, I'm just here for the good times. <laughs> wow, man, you really put that in for like an eighth of a second. Bill Daniels, the owner of the Utah Stars, a rival ABA team, even wrote Irving an unadulterated fan letter gushing in adoration. When the 1975-76 season started, the NBA and the ABA were on a collision course for a merger. To say that the doctor was the only reason for the merger is an overstatement. The okay, Oscar I'm sorry. I've been holding it for a while. Can we not agree that Dr. J had the absolute coolest fro we've ever seen? Like, you know, like, like some people just set the standard. Like, this was the standard for the afro. If it don't look as good as this, like, what are you doing? You know, like, you got you got to go for the Dr. J fro. It's so classic. Oscar Robertson versus NBA antitrust lawsuit had been settled, and the ABA had been successful in recruiting many great talents, including players like David Thompson, Artis Gilmore, George Gerving, and Moses Malone. The fast-paced style Malone. of the Renegade League and its innovations like the three-point shot were similarly valuable commodities. But make no mistake, the blue chip in the merger was Dr. J. More than anything, the NBA needed him. Yeah. The New York Times wrote that the NBA without the doctor was like boxing without Ali. Yeah, yeah. As the paperwork was drafted and the lawyers began organizing such a merger, the ABA embarked on what would be its final season. Doc continued to do Doc stuff leading the league in scoring, winning his third consecutive MVP, made first team all defense, first team all ABA, was an all-star, and had one of his many iconic moments when he measured his steps and took off from the free throw yep. line in January's dunk contest. Usual doc stuff. Damn. And remember, there were only seven teams that played the full season, so take these stats with a grain of salt, but he finished in the league's top 10 in points per game, rebounds per game, assists per game, steals per game, blocks per game, free throw percentage, free throws made, three point percentage, and three pointers. Made. Yes, a complete dominance, top to bottom. He was ready to graduate to, 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 a, to a better league for sure. After a seven game grind against the San Antonio Spurs in the playoffs, the Nets reached the ABA Finals against the Denver Nuggets. There, against a Nuggets team that featured three future Hall of Famers in David Thompson, Dan Issel, and Bobby Jones, coached by future Hall of Fame Larry Brown, Julius Irving submitted Get out of here. Larry Brown, look at, look, at, look at young Larry Brown. Holy cow. Look at that. By future Hall of Fame Larry Brown, Julius Irving submitted his magnum opus. Jones was the man tasked with guarding Irving for the series and was probably the most qualified man in the basketball world for the job. In the NBA, he would go on to make eight straight defensive first teams and earned the nickname, the Secretary of Defense. <laughs> Doc embarrassed him. In game one, Doc scored 45 points on 68% shooting, ripped down 12 rebounds, scored 18 of the Nets last 22 points, and hit the game-winning shot at the buzzer. Ooh, nice. He followed it up with 48 points, 14 rebounds, and eight assists in a game two loss. 25 of his points came in the fourth quarter. Damn, clutch. Falling into foul trouble in game three, 
Doc put up 31 points, 10 rebounds, and 4 assists in a 6-point win. Game 4, 34 points, 15 rebounds, and 6 assists, Good Lord, leading man. to a 9-point win and a 3-1 series lead. The resilient Nuggets refused to roll over in Game 5, eking out a win despite Doc's 37 points, 15 rebounds, and 5 assists. And in Game 6, Dr. J left it all out there. 31 points, 19 rebounds, 5 assists, 5 steals, and 4 blocks. Are you kidding? 19 rebounds? What? What? 19 rebounds, 5 assists, 5 steals, and 4 blocks five steals, in a 6-point victory. The last ABA game ever played, and one that ensured that Dr. J and the New York Nets remain forever the defending ABA champions. That's crazy. Look at these numbers. <laughs> this is LeBron James stuff. All against a stacked Nuggets team and the best defender of his generation. Dr. J's 1976 ABA Finals performance remains. I'm sorry, I can't let it go. You're going to say LeBron James stuff, but uh, yeah, what about the steals and the blocks? So no, this is way, way beyond LeBron James stuff. Way beyond. I don't see LeBron getting 19 rebounds, man. And if he does, he's not getting 31 points or 48 points. No, man, this is not LeBron James stuff. Do not discredit and disrespect the doc like this, man. That's insane. Series average, 33, 37.7, 14 rebounds, 5 assists. And he probably had a couple of blocks and a couple steals per game, too. And they're, and they're winning. Dr. J's 1976 ABA Finals performance remains one of the best championship efforts ever given by a basketball That's player. awesome. He was not, as some might be inclined to believe, just a trendsetter, just an entertainer. Yeah, yeah. It's not just he about his He was a dunks. supreme talent, a competitor, and a winner. When the two leagues merged, four ABA teams were absorbed into the NBA. The Denver Nuggets, the San Antonio Spurs, the Indiana Pacers, and the New York Nets. The Nets, already broke from paying their way into the league, had to sell Irving's contract to pay the Knicks for encroaching on their territory. Wow. They sold his contract to the Philadelphia 76ers, where he would play every one of his 11 NBA seasons. In those 11 seasons, there are two truths to be found. One, that he never quite reached the same heights as he did in the ABA. And two, that for those 11 years, there were few players in the world that you would have rather had than Dr. J. His first few years with the Sixers were divisive. They were loaded with guys like George McGinnis, Doug Collins, Daryl Dawkins, and Lloyd B. Free. But they lacked an identity and cohesion. As talented as they were, they were plagued by shoot first, me first egos. Doc, a team guy despite his abilities, made the conscious decision to tone down his aggressiveness and try to fit into a team concept. He still had his moments when he would press on the accelerator winning the 77 All-Star MVP and submitting a pantheonic dunk over Bill Walton in the 77 Damn. Finals. But his teammates never seemed to reciprocate that selflessness. Maybe Doc's biggest career disappointment came in the 77 Finals, where the heavily favored Sixers fell to Walton's upstart trailblazers. Maybe you can criticize him for not being aggressive enough, for being too passive and not being the type of guy to get on someone's ass and establish order through authority. Doc practically admitted to those things during those years. But the only reason any of that was a problem was because this was never really a Dr. J team. That would change in 1980, the same year he encountered two players that would become the toughest challenges of his career, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. Yeah. The 1986ers played a marvelous style of basketball, thanks to players like Henry Bibby, Maurice Cheeks, Lionel Hollins, and Doc's old matchup, Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones. They finished one game shy of 60 wins, the franchise's best mark in over a decade, and strode through the Eastern Conference, beating rookie Larry Bird Celtics four games to one in the Eastern Finals. In the NBA Finals, they faced the Los Angeles Lakers of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and rookie Magic Johnson. The series would see two iconic moments. One in a three-point Game 4 win, when Doc did something only he Damn, could do. Damn, I, I didn't know that highlight was from uh, the finals. 
a swooping behind-the-backboard layup that goes down as one of legend. And Magic's Herculean effort yeah. in Game 6. Yep. Never fear, Magic's here. After the teams traded victories through the first four games, Kareem won Game 5 for the Lakers with a monstrous 40.15 rebound performance. He was injured at the end of the game, though, and was forced to miss Game 6. We all know the rest. Yep. As a 20-year-old rookie, Magic Johnson jumped the ball at center, scored 42 points, grabbed 15 rebounds, dished out seven assists, and clinched the championship for the Lakers with one of the great playoff performances ever. Yep, and that's when we knew Magic was that guy. <laughs> like, no doubt, no doubt. An empty-handed doc yet again. But he wasn't the type of player to stop. In 81, he enjoyed his finest individual season captaining the Sixers to 62 wins, tied for the most in the league, made first-team All-NBA, and won the NBA's Most Valuable Player Award, five years and a league removed from his ABA prime. But of course, because these things are rarely straightforward and easy, the Sixers would choke away a finals trip later that postseason, blowing a 3-1 lead to the Celtics in the Eastern Finals. Damn. In 82, the Sixers won 58 games. Doc was again named to the NBA's first team, and again met Larry Bird's Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals, where again, the Sixers would open up a 3-1 series lead, which they would again let slip away, resulting in a winner-take-all Game 7 against the defending champion Celtics on the parquet floor. But this time, the Sixers had a secret weapon, a second-year guard named Andrew Toney, who earned himself the nickname the Boston Strangler. Oh, nice. He would score a game-high 34 points, and with Doc's stat-stuffing box score of 29 points, four rebounds, five assists, three steals, and three blocks, the Sixers arrived at their third finals in six years. They would face the Lakers again, yep. and would again fall, but their newfound resolve made the Sixers believe that they were just a piece away. That summer, they acquired that piece the most physically imposing center in the league. Moses. Moses Malone. See, this is what I love about the older eras, though, because it's such a cool journey to see, you know, the heartbreaks, the losses, and you're just slow. You're getting stronger. You're building. You're adding pieces. It's organic. And then you can, when you do, you know, rise to the top of the mountain and you accomplish your goal, it just makes it so much sweeter. As opposed to nowadays where it's like you lose a couple years with the team, then you blow up the team, and you go somewhere else where you think you can have a chance to win right now without doing any building. It's not the same, you know? It feels like Kevin Durant going over to, to Golden State to win a championship or the Miami Big Three. It's like, okay, cool, I guess. It would have been cooler to see Dwayne Wade win more championships on his own in, in, in Miami and LeBron win some in Cleveland by himself, but whatever but something like this it seems so heartbreaking freaking dr j can't win one here in the nba but he keeps fighting they keep fighting he was everything they needed yeah moses a monster the video isn't about him so i can't get too much into him but we'll hit the important stuff he was the defending regular season mvp and had also won the award in 1979 he was a rebounding machine on the Mount Rushmore of boards with Wilt, Russell, and Rodman. He could score effectively, was unbelievably physical, could run the floor, get every offensive board, and was such a sure thing on the glass that the rest of the team could leak out and start streaking down the court with the assurance that he would be getting the ball and throwing it ahead. He also just so happened to routinely give Kareem as much trouble as he would ever face. The results were immediate. The 83 Sixers were incomparable. By March, their record stood at 49-7. and seven. There was talk wow. of breaking the 72 Lakers' all-time wins record, and already a discussion about whether a championship would earn this team the mantle as the best team ever. Wow. By the end of the season, they'd cooled off slightly, finishing with a 65-17 and 17 record, still the best the NBA had seen in a decade. The Sixers played hungry. They played every game like it was a playoff game and came out like savages. They'd jump on you in the first half, but were an even better second half team and would usually pad their lead and walk to victory. Moses unlocked their fast break potential, 
while Doc provided the steady leadership and production that Dude, the team had long look, look at what he's doing with, with, with one hand, palm in the ball. It's insane. Or fast Watch break this. potential. While Doc provided the steady All leadership and production that the he team He never had used two hands that, that entire play. I think his hands might be bigger than MJ's, guys. Long come to expect. And it's worth mentioning that Doc still had those Dr. J moments in him, exemplified by his all-star MVP and maybe his career's most famous dunk. Yep. The end of the season award list was a who's who of Sixers players. The NBA's first team included two Sixers, Doc and Moses, with Moses taking home his third career MVP award. Nice. Andrew Toney had flourished as an all-around player, shooting the lights out to the tune of 20 points a game. And Bobby Jones, the secretary of defense, was named at the league's sixth man of the year. Plus, the league's defensive first team included three Sixers, point guard Mo Cheeks, Moses, and Jones. They were incredibly well-balanced, exceeded in every facet of the game, and had a fire and determination that no team could match. As the playoffs loomed, Moses was asked for a prediction. Malone, a soft-spoken giant with a Yogi Berra-like penchant for one-liners, was often quoted phonetically. <laughs> so when he responded simply, 4-4-4, four, 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 as in three straight playoffs No weeks, way. The prediction was famously printed as fo fo, fo. <laughs> And you know what? He was damn near perfect. The first round matchup with the Knicks, a sweep. Their Eastern Conference matchup with the Bucks, okay, that took five games. The Bucks avoided a sweep with a six point win in game four. But in the finals, against none other than the Los Angeles Lakers, the team that had sent Julius Irving's team home without a ring twice in the last four seasons, a four game sweep. Moses was a force averaging 26 points and 18 rebounds a game and out-rebounding Kareem Abdul-Jabbar 70 to 30 Damn. over the course of the series. 70 to 30. Moses Malone killed him that series. For his effort, he was named the finals MVP. It wasn't dramatic, but it must have been cathartic for all of the Sixers, but especially for Julius Irving. He grew to stardom and spent his prime playing basketball at the highest level it can be played in a renegade league without a television audience. He spent years competing at the highest levels possible, but on teams that did not fit him. And for one magical season, with a team for the ages, he finally captured the only award he did not possess. It's cool to see how happy he is. We all know if he didn't win, in the NBA, then he would have had to live with that narrative of like, oh, yeah, you were a great ABA player, but not a great NBA player. You couldn't get it done. I'm really glad he got it. He got it. He deserved it. An NBA championship. And a championship won in one of the most dominant ways imaginable. Their one playoff loss is still the fewest ever by a championship team. Crazy. And stood as a feat that would not be matched for 18 years. He might not have been the best player in the world. He might not have even been the best player on his team. But in his 12th professional season, at the age of 32, Julius Irving was the rock, the cultural touchstone, the captain of one of the greatest basketball teams ever assembled. Over the next few years, Irving's production slowly declined. His teams remained competitive, but neither he nor Moses would ever reach the same lofty heights in the new bird and magic era. So I think it's poetic that he won his ring in 83. Although the two had already won championships, Larry Bird wow, and Magic- Wow, imagine that. He, he wins his ring in 83, 84, Jordan gets drafted. So yeah, we enter the uh, the bird and magic era. And yeah, it, it's, 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 it's kind of just, uh, it's kind of poetic there. It's a handoff. Johnson would not face each other in the finals until 1984. Doc had given it all. He had done his best and gotten his just in time for the next generation to begin in earnest. He announced his retirement before the 1986-87 season. It would be his 16th, a career span. <laughs> I always was... remember this. 
Because he's like, he's doing like the, oh, my back is sore thing. Watch this. 87 season. Oh. It would be his 16th, <laughs> a career span that was practically unheard of at the time. That season, he enjoyed a retirement tour that would become the benchmark for those to come after. In every road game, he was presented with gifts and mementos, asked to make short speeches, and showered with cheers and applause. Nobody, not even the Celtics, could help but to appreciate Dr. J for everything he'd That's done. That's cool, man. Including for keeping basketball alive at a time when it could have died. At the time of his retirement, including his ABA stats, Julius Irving was professional basketball's third all-time scorer, was second in steals and 10th in blocks. He was an all-star every single year of his career, 16 times total, the fourth Damn. most by any player. During his 11-year Philadelphia tenure, the only franchise that won more total games was the Lakers wow. by 12. 12 total? Jeez. He never missed the playoffs once in his career, not even in his twilight, and played in 71 or more regular season games in every season but his last. How many? In 71 or more regular not bad. season. Not bad. He's a healthy man. In games in every season but his last. In total, he won four Most Valuable Player awards, three championships, and was a nine-time selection to the first team of his league, four in the ABA and five in the NBA. He ended his career with a win percentage of 67.3%. He won 67.3% of the games in which he played, a mark that is higher than that of Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Steph Curry, Wilt Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, Jerry West, Moses Malone, Oscar Robertson, Kevin Durant, and nearly every other player that is at a comparable level of all-time greatness, not named Magic Johnson, Magic, Larry Bird. Bird, Russell, Shaq, Kareem, or Duncan. He wasn't just a great basketball player. He held in his enormous hands the essence of the game, what it was and what it should be. He exemplified to a generation what a basketball player was, paved the way for and won a championship in the sport's golden age. He led one of the greatest careers in basketball history, all while being one of the most revered, honored, respected athletes in the world. Pat Riley said after Doc retired, there may have been some better people off the court, some mothers, the Pope, but there was only one Dr. J, the player. He changed the way basketball is viewed, played, and appreciated. He left it better than he found yep. it. One of the first real modern superstars. That that's I love how he says this because that's that's a huge thing. If you love the game and you respect the game, then you give to the game and you leave the game better than you found it. There are some who destroy the game. They just take from the game and they leave it worse than when they found it. Not a fan of those guys, but guys like him, Magic, Bird, um, you know, Jordan, like I, I have so much respect for them because they, they helped the game grow. They made the game healthier, stronger, you know, more appealing. They gave everything to the game that they love. And that's real love. You know, that's real love. Just taking away from something. That's not love. That's not love at all. He left it better than he found it one of the first real modern superstars. There has never been, nor will there ever be, another like him. A true living legend. He was more than a basketball player. He just was basketball. Wow, that was really cool, you guys. Um, once again, Clayton Crowley is the channel here. Uh, highly suggest. I mean, I don't even have to suggest it. If you guys enjoyed this documentary, you know what to do. Go over there, check it out. Um, check out, check out uh, Clayton's um, content. It's it's really good stuff. I really enjoyed this this documentary very very much. Um, I learned a lot. There's some things I knew about, you know, like more so about his NBA career. I knew a lot about a lot of that. One thing I didn't know about was 
how good of a rebounder he was, how great he was at defense, blocks and steals. And um, what else did I learn? Um, I didn't know barely anything about his ABA career. So I, did, I didn't know exactly how dominant he was there. And um, I always heard the ties to, to him at Rucker, but I also didn't know he was the one who put the Rucker on, on the map like that. I, I just thought like, you know, there's so many famous people, famous players who've gone to the Rucker, but I didn't know he was like the one. He was the guy who started this. So really cool stuff. I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Um, Dr. J is definitely somebody we should not we should not forget. You know, as much of a Jordan fan as I am, just because we had Jordan does not mean we need to forget about Dr. J or disrespect him whatsoever. I don't have a damn bad thing to say about this man. You know, what a hell of a basketball player, hell of a guy. You know, I'm glad we still have him um, because he's he's a treasure to, to basketball as a whole, just like Bill Russell was. And rest in peace, my friend. That was so sad to see because he was such a cool, just 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 a cool pioneer to, to have around to remember where where the league was and, and where the game is now and who paved the way. All right, everybody, I am going to get out of here for tonight. Um, hope you all enjoyed it. Hope you all have a wonderful night. Leave the video a like if you enjoyed it and uh, subscribe to the channel if you want more. If you do, I'll see you tomorrow night. Um, yeah. Thanks as always for watching, you guys. I appreciate I appreciate watching this stuff together. And I will see you in the comments later on. And have a wonderful, peaceful night, all right? Have fun. Stay cool. Be good to your people. Love your loved ones while you got them, all right? Peace out.